what we're going to do today is the kind of Glasgow style of lecturing. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you it. And then at the end of that, I'm going to tell you what I've told you. So we'll look at the rationale for putting figures on layout. We'll have a look at the figures that are commercially available and how to prepare these for painting. Have a look at the ranges of paints that are on the market and of course, uh, painting techniques and brushes as well. And have a look at positioning them on the layout at the kind of accessories that are all available. And finally, yes, I'll tell, tell you once again, what I've just told you. Okay, the rationale. Um, Basically, people use railroads. That's the whole purpose of railroads. Although the number of figures on a railway layout can uh, vary dramatically depending on time and place. Big exhibition layout I know relatively well. Uh, friends were intimately involved in it. It's about 30 feet by 15 and has uh, exhibited and featured in the model tray. So, it has roughly 200 figures. Uh, by comparison, field inch is about a 20th of the size, but it has in the millennium period, 50 odd figures and in the Belle Epoque, uh, around about 1900, 1914, it had 110 figures and five. So roughly about 20 times more figures, a greater density of figures on field inch than Alloa. Now, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with a field inch or that there's anything wrong with Alloa. It's just that various different types of layouts require different numbers and styles of figures. For example, 100 years ago or more, people lived much more in the street. Houses were smaller, the entertainments were on the street. So you will find in historical layouts a much higher proportion of figures than from the 50s, 60s or more. And likewise, the type of layout or area depicted will again give some clues. Rural layouts will be relatively thinly populated, urban ones very much more so, and industrial ones somewhere in between. And also in terms of timing, there are relatively few winter layouts about, but you wouldn't expect as many figures there as in the height of summer. And likewise, there are some layouts that are set at night and very effective they are, but they would have relatively few figures eh, as compared to one set in the working day. The figures available are many and varied. I'm going to try, basically stick to the 176 scale as far as possible. I can't really speak for any or the ranges available, the Andrew C. Stadden stage of cast metal figures are, to my mind, about the finest available on the market. They are beautifully cast and absolutely to scale. And with the packs of 10 for 10 pounds, pound a figure, it sounds steep, but compared to the quality you're getting and compared to other manufacturers, it's not a bad buy at all. And I have certainly over the years amassed through Christmas presents and birthday presents and well placed requests to the family, you know, most of the range in my layer. Mike Tate he does cast metal as well. His tend to be chunkier and he does feature personality, which is quite good if you're wanting, you know, standout figures at the front of your layer. Pete Goss, uh, he's now started Dead Nailsborough, which is a beautiful piece of work. His figures, again, are chunky. They're much more akin to some wargaming ones, and the anatomy of them isn't old as there. Langley do an immense range of figures for all sorts of periods, from the late Victorian through the Edwardian and up to the 20th century uh, and 21st century. And of course, they do a huge range of accessories as well. John Day, a small manufacturer, tends to do uh, cameos of workplaces. So these are quite good, if you, particularly if you have an industrial layout. Others are P and D Mars, and you know there are various other small manufacturers as well. 
In terms of HO metal, uh, Andrew Stadden does his range as well in that. Now, looking at them, these are the double O figures. You can see what you get for ten pounds: a set of beautifully cast and beautifully designed figures that are anatomically correct and that paint up beautifully because the sculpting is of such high quality. They are principally for the Edwardian period, and they cover upper class, middle class, working class, and delightfully, they do ranges of children, which is not something you see an awful lot of. They also do local tools, which are multi post so you need to glue those before you paint. Again, my kid, his personality figures, perhaps the detailing isn't all that great, but if you have a layout set around about 1900-1914, it's nice to feature someone like Sherlock Holmes, with or without Dr. Watson or Professor Moriarty. The Pete Goss ones, fairly chunky, uh, and set from you know, the 60s, but you'll also get ones for the Edwardian period. And the faces don't always come out well, but you know you can disguise that with clever brushwork most of the time. And there are some that you can buy ready painted as well. The Langley range is immense, absolutely immense, and goes across the, the last 130, 140 years quite admirably. As well as the figures, they also do things like shop fronts. Uh, that's from the Victorian Edwardian period. And they are great for dealing with big teams as well. And at the top end of the market, they do things like fairground attractions, which are beautiful when you see them. They can be motorized as well. They come with transfers to cover the clever lettering. But if you want to go up for something like the Walter, so you are talking coming on for 150 quid for a uh, one complete kit. So think carefully. I mean, I'm sure they are wonderful, but cost a lot. John Day figures, you can see the industrial theme, the, the warehouse set there, the brewery set, and so forth. Uh, good for little cameos. Uh, they also do road vehicles, if you're into that kind of thing. In terms of double plastic, huge veins in terms of the quality and price. And the high end of the market, you can get anatomically correct figures from Medellu. And these are done with the laser printing, that kind of thing. The, and they're, you know, the, the figures are actually human to have scanned, and then uh, they can be printed off. The old Airfix Dapple ranges set primarily in the 50s and 60s, still good, good value, and okay, the molds are tiring slightly, but they're still a lot of good figures. At the other end of the market, for 100 figures from China, you can pay about a five or sometimes even close to three. These tend to have relatively limited numbers of figures, so they're okay if you want to bulk out a crowd in the background, but you really need to do some fancy brush work to make them stand out if they're going to be anywhere near the front of the volume. Platers, they are actually not bad. They tend to be on the chunky side, uh, but they can be mixed relatively well with metal figures. And in terms of these four, deluxe models are made by German film Pfizer, who have a huge range as well. And the historical figures are rather wonderful. But they're also good if you want to put people inside coaches and so on, a range of sitting down figures as well. You can also buy Fallar and Knox. These tend to be very painted. And quite honestly, I'm not sure if the difference in price for a painted figure compared to an unpainted set is actually all that great value because with relatively little practice you can do these equivalent results yourself. The Modelo ones, as I say, these are printed, the 3D printing as you call it. Uh, and yes, there are figures that actually scan, 
the end of user play and they are, you know, just a delight to, to, work, to work with. They are expensive and they are relatively frantic. Yeah, uh, you're talking probably about three pounds a uh, figure, maybe four pounds now. So if you're going to populate your uh, layout with Modelo, you don't want a dense urban scene. You know, use these sparingly and severely. Those who do World War I layouts, yes, they, they are catered for as well from Modelo, and they are attractively cool. The Chinese figures, absolutely the other end of the scale. There is the kind of thing you can get. A limited number of uh, figures are posed in each page. The ready painted ones, you can make something of by putting on a light brown or even a black wash. Uh, but to be honest, it's probably as well uh, priming and painting them yourself. The Slater's figures, uh, those are, again, not bad, tend to be from the 50s, 60s period onward, but relatively good value. And, you know, you only have to watch the, the ones on the wheel because they tend to be two-dimensional rather than three. Okay, once you decide to buy, and you're probably as well starting with relatively bigger like platers, they, those come uh, about 10 quid a pack or so for 25 or so. Or you can get yourself a set of Chinese ones if you want to practice. Uh, so like a five of, you know, even if you mess them up, it's no dead for. Great, cleaning the flash off. If you're doing this with a plastic figure, you want a really dark knife. And that you basically go along the flash line. For metal figures, a slightly heavier one per night is quite fine. And you do for war gamers do is basically scrape along the, the flat line and you know basically scrape it off rather than cutting. If there are any figures to be assembled, you know, the multi-pose figures, use the appropriate glue. For plastic figures, what I use is the Rebel Contactor, which is quite good, it's relatively quickly. For metal figures, yeah, uh, probably, if they're not going to, they're going to be a bit poopery to, to get together, uh, you want to use something quick setting like super glue. I'm going to handle them extensively. Something more robust like epoxy too far would be the, the way to go. But again, you only need very small amounts. So, you're probably as well sticking to the super glue for speed. If you're going to customize or change the figures, you know, this is the time to do it before you actually wash or uh, time them. So then you can do this, probably something best left till you feel a bit more confident than you can do. Most figures have uh, an agent on them, something like talc that will stop them clinging to the mold when they're uh, released. So this is probably best washing off. Do warm soapy water, leave to dry. You can pat them dry with a paper towel. Better experience to suggest speeding up the process by putting them in the oven is a disastrous experiment that I would not repeat. Having you know learned the hard way. Uh, dry them off, fine, and then priming. And I've left that with a question mark. When I first did that, this talk three, four, five years ago, I was you know open-minded about priming. But five years on, I would say it is absolutely essential. And quite often the decision you make about which primer to use will determine the painting style that you use. But I'll come back to that later. The one thing you have to make your mind up before you go through much of this is how you're going to attach the figures to the layout. There are several options. You can glue them in permanently, either with super glue or something more robust like epoxy. That's all well and good, but the trouble is if you are exhibiting the layout in particular, these are likely to become knocked and they, they won't stand much well anyway. So you'll be left with a bigger detach and uh, an ugly mark where the glue was on your layer. 
What I prefer to use are uh, usually brass wire. You can use something as little as 0.4 mil brass wire, but I think they're much better with 0.5 or better still 0.6 mil wire. The 0.6 mil wire has twice the cross section of 0.4 wire, so it will be at least twice as the one. And these are stuck in the, to the, the peaks or some of the appropriate before you actually go to painting and finding. Better experience again says don't use a power drill because the heat generated will weld the figure to the drill bit that you're using. Use a pin vise for this, and you will prong your fingers as well every now and then, but it's still, I think, the best way to go. The other alternative times past was to use clear acetate, which was pretty much the way mostly of where 30, 40 years ago. And it, it looks fine, but it depends on the viewing angle. From the wrong angle, it looks as if these people are standing in a puddle, or they are the people that have the mini cloud over them, indicating semi-permanent depression. Or worse still, that they have had uh, an accident. You can do it. Uh, the advantage to that is they're relatively easy to move. So for exhibiting, that's not a bad way. But my preference would still be with pins. If you have many assemblies of figures, little cameos, on a discrete part of the layer, you can use magnet base as well. So you have a sub base, you put the magnet base underneath, and you have a, a seal paper or something on that point of the layer. So that, that's a reasonable alternative, but it doesn't cover individual figures very well. Right, figures don't always come the way you want them, and sometimes you may wish to customize. These are some Pete Goss figures. The lady on the right is pretty well as she was, but I didn't like the angle that the head was at, so I drilled a hole, uh, sorry, take after the lady first, drilled a hole, and then inserted the brass wire, and then reassembled the lady head. On the left is a poster sign that that lady will carry in good time. So there you can see the lady with the head reattached. There's her with a poster, and there's a thumb uh, with a placard as well. All three ladies there are fitted with thin signal to be attached to the layer. The lady on the left is a Modelo figure um, from the 30s. Now, ladies' fashion is much more period specific than gents. And for a layout before World War I, I had to lengthen the, the skirt or dress. And that I did using the loop button. Molded the shape, attached it to the figure, and then molded, applying, you know, some moisture if necessary, and you can get a little molding knife to help you do this. And again, leave it overnight to set. And you can tell from the, the different styles of figures that those two sets of um, manufacturers, the figures will not mix. So they have to be separated on the way. In terms of priming, aerosols are probably what most people will use. I find the best data from a Danish company called Army Painter that's been manufactured in Italy. And they come in all shapes and colors. They're very good for mass painting of war games armies, but I usually use their black or sometimes their white spray primers for the uh, railway figures. Uh, those I think are best. You can use sulfur. The gray primer is quite good. You can use the red oxide as well. But the black or white, I think, are the ones to go for. Remember, when you're doing this to ventilate the place you're doing, I, I usually do it in the garage. And when you're holding figures, you can either leave them on paper and make sure they're absolutely dry before you turn them over and do the other. If you've got little pins in the feet, you can put them on little holders. Otherwise, you can glue the base to 
uh, goal, a wooden goal, and set these into a holder and paint them there. And with the best will in the world, you'll probably miss some bits. So it is best to touch up the figures with black or white paint so that you have complete coverage. That way, the adhesion of your top coat will be so light. In terms of the ranges of paint, there are, most people will probably have them invested in large numbers of enamel paint. And they have the advantage of being durable. And I started painting war game figures using enamel paint, but it meant because of the long drying time, I could only paint one color per night. So any one figure would have to be done over the course of a fortnight, which wasn't terribly good. Acrylics came along in the 80s, and these are like nights and days. Going from enamels to acrylics is like going from an old style imperial typewriter to a modern word processor. Having tried acrylics, I don't think many people would ever look back. They have the advantage of being mixable, which uh, if you're only starting off with acrylic paints and dabbling and putting your finger in the, the water, as it were, you don't need necessarily to buy a huge range. You can buy a set of six or a dozen and mix them in to get the shades you need. The absolute advantage of acrylics is their quick drying. 10, 15, 20 minutes in normal temperatures will do it which does mean you can paint the front of a figure, put it down, come back 10 minutes later and paint the back using the same color. They are also very forgiving. In animals, if you make a mistake, it's a bit of a problem. But with acrylics, if it's not too bad, you can have a spare paintbrush uh, at hand, wet it and basically draw off by capillary action the excess paint for the paint in the, the wrong way. Or if that doesn't work, or if you put on too much water on your brush in the first place, you can simply dab it off with a paper tissue and start that color again. So acrylics, I think, absolutely the way to go. There are various uh, ranges. For hues to war games, they've got a huge different set of colors, although they do need careful stirring. Vallejo are my own personal favourites. They are manufactured, I think, in Spain. They come in little tubes that squirt out, and they do need a bit of taking if you leave them for any time. Coat d'arm, I come in little tubs and need stirring. Not as good as Vallejo, in my opinion. Citadel, good. If you can get past the exotic names they give their paint. They're aimed at not only war gamers, but fantasy war gamers whom the rest of us don't actually talk about, except in hard school. Real match, you'll have some for the actual real vehicles. These do tend to be a bit on the bright side for figures. Humbrol are good, uh, no, no question about that. Long established in the market. Foundry are a small war games company, and they sell sets of paints, so they're quite good for a uh, process of layering or highlighting. Not something that most really models will encounter. If you're just wanting to dabble with acrylics, you can get sets of Reeves paints or Windsor and Newton off the internet. You can get a dozen for about a tenner, which is probably enough to mix and match. The only other color you'd probably need beyond that is a specially designed flesh color, because it's probably the most difficult tone to, to mix up. All. Okay, so you've got your paint, you're ready to go, you've got your figure. You sit down, well, the one thing that's absolutely essential is decent light, because if you can't see what you're painting, then it does become rather a trying process. Uh, I use an angle poise lamp to get absolute clarity or, or best clarity I can. And of course, Sitting near a window or having a background light on as well is all to be good. Sit comfortably because you could well be sitting there for some time, an hour at a time or more. When I first retired, I used to spend a whole day painting a regiment of Madrosa's army at a time, 20 figures a day. So I was there from 
half nine till half four. But I, I had 20 rather nice figures at the end of it. So you will be sitting some time. Make sure you're comfortable. And make sure you've got plenty of space on the, the working area. There's nothing worse than knocking over a tub of space. But needless to say, it'll be the runniest space that you have. Or worse still, one of those color washes that are designed to run in the first place. So plenty of space. In terms of brushes, at least one good brush. There are a variety of makes on the market, and you don't have to use your wood brush for everything. But when you're doing figures, particularly hand spades, belts, braces, and such, that wood fine brush is essential. These tend to be stable, and they come in codes, you can get O's, but you, for figure painting, you want a double O or a treble. The best on the market, to my mind, is a Cullen Street Masterclass. Now, that will set you back the best part of a tenner. So when you're buying, do take the code. What you want is a BR7017. That will give you fine detailing. I actually bought a Cullen Street Masterclass not knowing that, and it's basically just like any other. So, you, know, you want the fine one, check the code. As I say, you can get even fearful sets. But be careful because sometimes the brush hairs may become easily detached. So if you're varnishing in particular, seem to pull the hairs out of the brush. Get a decent brush for varnishing and use it only for that. The other thing that you can get is a dry brushing brush. Now, this dry brushing is a technique where you put nearly dry paint onto the con no, highlighted contour of the figure. This is terribly hard on brushes, and it's not something you'd want to use your Clinty Master Flash for. So if you're going to do a lot of it, it's probably worth spending two, three quid on a dry brush. You probably pick these up at a war gaming show rather than a real modeling show. Okay, uh, when you're painting, you don't have to paint everything. I remember working figures in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when 28 mil figures were the fashion. And people not only painted the whites of the eyes, but the eyeballs as well. You don't need to go into that kind of detail. Because from about 30, 40 feet, all you see of people's eyes are basically the dark bit, uh, the shadows underneath the eyebrows. And likewise, the mouth is basically any shadows underneath the nose. So you don't have to paint everything. And also remember, very little is black and white. Most things are painted grey, either dark grey or cream or white or light grey. Some things are pure white, but it is the exception rather than the rule. So be prepared to tone down white paint with some yellow or at the nearest hint of black. Over time, you will develop your own style. I like to characterize mine as classic mid 50s Fino because I do prefer little black lines around the main block color. And I certainly use black lines for eyes and mouth. When you are painting, start from the deepest part of the figure and paint upwards and outwards. Nine times out of ten, that will be hand. -made. Don't overload your brush. It's the tip that does the work. And be prepared to keep cleaning your brush tip regularly rather than having paint dry. Uh, there's nothing worse than a brush that is getting crusty with paint and it will spoil your figures as well. And it won't do the brush very much good either. If you're painting, paint in batches. It'll take all day and forever if you paint one figure at a time. You'll also waste a lot of paint and it's much more difficult to build up expertise. The easiest way to do it is, you know, the mass production techniques of division of labor. So you start with say a dozen figures, you can paint six of them, do the faces, and then do the hands, let them dry, do the other six, and so on. When you're coming to colors, 
armies are rather easier in some ways than the civilians, because armies, everyone wears pretty much the same kind of thing, especially in regiments. Whereas civilians, and particularly women, the things are much more individual. So you can paint two or three, perhaps, of your 12 figures will have the blue tints. Others will have brown, others will have green. And that way, over the dozen, you will get some variety. And if you want to mix the, the paint as you go, you've got some blue paint and some green paint left over and three figures to do, you can mix the blue and green and you'll get a variety of colours there. So it's much more like what we have in real life, especially modern times. As you paint, you'll find that certain mixes of paint work best for certain techniques. A very thin dilute paint is good if you're painting, say, coaches that have paneling and the infill uh, can be infilled in white and such. But for figures, it's, it's much less common. But you can apply black brown washes, although if you are applying a wash, it's better to use the specialized washes that you can get because they don't, they have, sorry, they do have a much finer grain of paint in them and then the color will not go up. If you're doing edging, the paint should be runny rather than thick. You'll get a much better straight or curved or regular line using that. Some paint, yes, once you get it, Perfect, but if you're wanting to do faces, belts, bands, veins, anything that requires detail work, the paint should be perfect. Goldilocks, if you like, not too runny, not too thick. For bigger blocks of color, trousers, dresses, and the like, you want the paint slightly thick because it will adhere better and you'll get a denser color. It's only when the paint gets gloopy or beyond that you want to use it for dry brushing. When the paint is on the point of dry. That way you take your brush, make sure the brush is dry, the paint is all dry, and you brush it lightly over the exposed part of that color that you want to highlight. Right, speaking of techniques, we've pretty well covered dry brushing. Its cousin is highlighting, and there, that's where you have a contoured garment. Let's say a lady's dress or a pair of trousers that have contour. And what you want to do is have the main color as is, but the highlights you want to lift, and that you would do by adding the merest hint of white or some other lightning shade. So, and you paint only the raised parts of that. So you get a two or three, three tier effect, going from the dullest bits in the hollows to the lightest bits in the uh, uplifted contour. And yes, when you're mixing, you can mix little bits at a time. Now you can buy mixing trays. I used to use old trays. Uh, Circular magazine still in their cellophane wrappers for mixing, but just mix a little at a time till you get the color and consistency that you want. You can buy mixing trays as well, but the cheap and cheerful magazine is just as good. Beware though that black in particular will change a color quite dramatically, so add very sparingly white also. And if you have to stir or indeed Shake your paint, make sure you do that before you take it out of the tub or the bottle if you can. Some paints are like James Bond's uh, martini, they should be taken rather than stirred. But be careful if you are shaking or stirring too much, make, let the paint settle and that the bubbles will subside. That's particularly the case with varnish. Um, and likewise, look after your brush when you're painting, it is your best friend. And at 10 pounds a time, a Kalinsky masterclass will last months, if not years, hundreds of figures, but you do have to take care of it. Make sure the tip in particular never dries out. And when you're finished a session, you can slide on your fingers, shape the brush to a point, 
and then expensive brushes all can come with a plastic a cone to cover them and stop them getting wet. So look after your brushes. As I said before, the principle is start at the bottom outward, and this will usually be the face. Now, depending on how you've undercoated, uh, the techniques are slightly different. If you've used white undercoat or been a grey uh, as an alternative, what you're probably looking at as a technique is the block paint. So you will paint the face and that's fine. Let it dry and then you can come back with a light brown wash and put that over the facial feature. And it will settle in the deeper part. A light brown one will settle in the eyes and uh, perhaps between the lips and perhaps the hollows and the cheeks if there are any there. And then you can come back with the original color, perhaps with an addition of some white and you can highlight the, the facial features. It's worth taking time with the face because that is something that gives your faces some character and personality. On the other hand, if you've gone with a black undercoat, there's two ways of going about the face and to an extent the hand. What you can do is spot paint the dark, but a slightly darker place the bits that are most prominent, the brow, the nose, the cheek, the chin. Then you can go back with a lightened tone and highlight the point of the nose, the rim of the brow, the point of the, uh, the chin, and so on. And that will give you a 3D effect. It can also give a slightly villainous effect. So if you're painting Professor Moriarty, perhaps that's the kind of technique you want to use. Now, the alternative, again, using the black undercoat, is to dry brush the dark flesh. Now, you can mix this technique with the one above. So you can spot paint one figure, and then the next one with paint that's left on the brush, you can dry brush. And that, again, will highlight the brow, the nose, and so on. And then you can go back with a lighter color, perhaps some white in the flesh color, or perhaps a different flesh tone, and lift the figure by painting the lighter flesh. And that will give you a face, and once you've got the face done, I know it's slow and it can be dispiriting, but that actually will give you a flying start. Now, if you're with the black undercoat, I like to leave the minutest gap between colors, so that with cuts and collars, There'll be a minute gap between that and the hand, and it does make things stand out quite well. Uh, likewise, with belts, bands, and all the rest of it. And that's why I do tend to call my uh, basic technique classic mid 50s, you know. The problem with it is, though, that you're actually painting a negative, and when you get the hollows in the clothes, what will happen is the paint will be densest in the hollows and thinnest on the raised contours and therefore darkest. You are actually painting as a negative. Now, it doesn't matter too much because you can go back and highlight these, but with reds and yellows, it is much more difficult because of where they are in the color spectrum. So if you're going to use reds and yellows to any extent, you're probably better with a white undercoat. But you can get around it as a base by highlighting. With the white undercoat, uh, it's quite easy because the shading is natural. The deepest tones will be in the darkest fold, in the deepest fold. And it's quite easy to paint on highlights with a, a lighter color or even to dry brush them. You can get an even better effect by applying a wash, either light or dark brown or even black, and then going back, should you so wish, uh, and highlighting further or dry brush. It may not make all that much difference in the end. But the ladies here on the left were given a white undercoat, painted, and then a light brown wash. The gents on the bench next door were given a black undercoat and highlighted. You can see the gent in the center, his buttons have the faintest hints of a dark patch found about. But there isn't all that much in it at the end of the day. Okay, we met some ladies earlier. 
here they are now, and they're going to a certain place in the or the ones on the outside are. The ones in the centre, I think, is not going there. She's off to do her shopping because she doesn't own in at all there. But there they are en masse, and again, you can see the lady shopping. The other figures there are older ones I bought back in the, the 70s when Model Wheel Scotland was still in the McLellan Gallery. Discovered them, got them out, painted them up. The faces aren't all perfect. Now, it's not always your fault if the faces don't come out well. Sometimes the figures are not all that well sculpted. So if that does happen, you can just say, put your fold up and put it down to the the last question I suppose is, do you varnish the figures? Well, it will give protection and you can spray or you can paint. And it depends on what you're going to handle your figures. If you're a war gamer, these will get handled a lot and you're probably better to do it. Uh, in terms of really modeling, they're not going to be handled that much. Uh, you can mess up a good figure if you get the varnish and go on over it there. The one thing is to be careful you don't have any metallic paint or finishes on your figures. This is rare in railway modeling. It's relatively common in war gaming, the saw containers and the like. So what will happen is that the varnish will lift and separate the metallic paint. It will leave the base color of the metallic paint on the spot it's meant to be, but the small metallic flakes will a little. So don't uh, varnish anything that has metallic finishes in it. Do the varnishing and then add them after. If you are brushing, be careful, don't over brush because varnishes do bubble up very easily indeed. So a little lightly loaded on the brush and relatively few and slow brush strokes. If you are spraying a light spray rather than a heavy one, two light coats are usually better than one heavy. Okay, positioning figures. Well, the figures will come in two main sets of poses. You will get some walking figures, but these are relatively rare. Most of the figures that you will get simply because of the, uh, the problems of modeling will be standing. So they'll be doing probably one of three things. They'll either be waiting as on a platform, they'll be looking at something as in a shop window, or they'll be talking to each other. And that, I suppose, will be the guiding thing when you position them down the layer. Again, avoid putting chunky and slim figures together. The chunky ones, provided the faces have come off well, you probably better sit at the front than slim ones at the back. And likewise, double O figures at the back and H for ones if you're using them at all at the back, creating some kind of force protection. You can use H O figures to extend for holding the use, but anatomically it doesn't always work. And likewise, if you do have personality figures, put them at the front of your layers, otherwise it's not worth spending five or six pounds um, buying them. Oh, the suffragette meeting. The ones, the figures with the rather poorer faces have turned their back on the looker, and that's the uh, way to do it. Lady to shopping is still here. You can get exact trays that bring things to life. Post office uh, boxes and stuff like and vehicles. And again, you can position them either, you know, the Langley ones in the shop front on the left. The old style pram is from a John Boyle kit from the 80s. And it is figured grouped talking to each other by Angela. Also possible to have little cameos, the John Day figures, the, the, the man with the dog talking, and the brewery tray unloading. And figures, they tend not to be evenly spread on a platform. They tend to be grouped either in couples, families, or the odd solo figure, you can probably see a uh, Moriarty here on his own. You can add them to 
buildings as well. That's obviously a black undercoated figure in the island cabin. And it will be lit. And likewise, the Caledonian cabin, the, the figure inside, uh, again, the light in going down. And you can also add extra things like fire buckets, you can see up, and someone else standing on the balustrade there on his way in for it. Local crews as well, quite good to do, and it's probably what going up market for a Modelo set or the like if you have an expensive kit built local or one of the new uh, high detail quality ones in Batman or for me. Okay, here we go. And um, you're not going to see much of the, the folk on this, but here we go. You can see this on the platform. And a fairly busy shield in there. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I should have reshot this. The Maid of Morgan is coming around here at perhaps an unrealistically high speed. But it's a good shot of the case. And you can see the street scene and the station go. And field in, yes, two trams now. And again, you can see the figures and some coaches in situ, some former London or Western uh, coaches as well, as well as the kit bashed ones. And 828 eight coming around again at a more realistic speed this time with the Maid of Morven. The figures on the left, there are some pricer figures there. And it does have two, and there are figures in the Maid of Morgan, though it's still probably going too fast to make them out clear. And lastly, it eight again. I did fit local crew here. It wasn't the straightforward the experience I was hoping because I hadn't thought ahead fully, and the box actually broke off the fireman eh, because I took him too far proud of the local car. So here you are with a repositioned fireman and a train of 30 ton high capacity wagons. And the track laying crew there in an airfix figure. And a figure in the cast wagon as well. Those I fixed eventually with black tack, which has the advantage of not being too obvious, but not permanent either. Okay, so in summary, when you're painting, sit comfortably and make sure it's well lit. And if you're using space, make sure you have decent ventilation. Use sharp knives, cutting mat, watch your fingers. Use a thin vice rather than a power drill. Adhesives appropriate for the task. A rebel compactor for plastic and super glue or epoxy or metal. You don't have to buy all your paints at once. You can acquire them over time. I've been painting figures for 40 years. And you know, over time, you build up a goal. It's good fun to mix paints. You know, it's worth trying. And it's worth experimenting as well. Your technique will change over time. And rest assured, you will get better. At least one good brush, and this is not necessarily a commercial for the Clinton Masterclass, but I wouldn't look back. And finally, take your time, enjoy it. It doesn't have to be done by some that are always 